Paul, thank you so much for being here with me today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. So for everyone who's listening, Paul really works closely with cancer patients and works on doing research for healing cancer, which to me is very inspiring because my thought is that cancer has this reputation for being something that is just like, oh my God, if you get a cancer diagnosis, it's a death sentence. When so many people are so intimidated and afraid of it and because of the reputation it holds, my thought is that if we can find ways to actually witness people curing cancer at all stages and of all types, then I feel like we can cure and heal anything. (laughs) It inspires hope in that regard. Yes, absolutely. Cancer is one of the most common diseases on the planet. The statistics from the cancer institutes are about one in two people develop cancer today. So Which is talking- so crazy. Yeah. yeah. And then there's all the other diseases, right? But cancer is the peak, I think, because once you understand the actual root cause of cancer, then it begins to bring knowledge and awareness to essentially all the other diseases in general. And the main factor is understanding that cancer is a psycho-emotional disease related to emotional suppression, unresolved stress in our lives. And a lot of humanity still thinks that it's caused by many different factors. And of course, there would be contributing factors to cancer all, all over the world. Like there's, there's all sorts of things that are detrimental to our health. But there's only one thing that causes cancer, and it's psycho-emotional suppression. And the only reason I'm so confident to say such a thing, and a lot of people would disagree with me, but not everyone and not people that have developed cancer that have really been clear about why, um, mm-hmm. is because I lived with people with cancer for 10 years. you know, And what I was doing in that experience is I was not actually trying to help my clients strengthen their immune system. I mean, we were covering lifestyle factors for sure, because those are important. We were eating organic food and we were meditating and we were getting out in nature and drinking clean water and on and on. But a lot of my clients that I worked with and the clients that I work with today have already done all that stuff to the T, I mean, to perfection. There are people that I've worked with that have done 30 day water fasts like five times in a row. There's people that have told me, Paul, I eat juicing. Oh my God, I've been juicing for nine months. I've spent $50,000 on juicing and I'm still not healed. What's going on? And of course, then there's traditional approaches to cancer, which unfortunately also don't address the cause. And so people's, because we can destroy cancer in lots of ways. There are ways to kill cancer. But cancer grows back unless the root cause is addressed. So because of so many years of experience working on the root cause of cancer only, it's become very, very clear to me that there's just one cause to cancer. And now when I work with clients, I can help them identify the root cause in one session. That's what I offer now is a root cause session. Two hours, we figure out what the real cause is. And it's always psychological every single time. So it's important to just really come to realize the truth of this because then we can really make progress as a humanity to start addressing our psycho-emotional realities, the lives that we are living, the, the template of life that humanity is following. Because that template of life that overall humanity is following is causing cancer at a massive number, you know, one in two people. So the more we focus on all these physical things like supplements, juicing, whatever, treatments, then we're not actually focusing on the real cause, which is emotional. So it really limits how much progress we can actually make. And yeah, once you start to understand cancer, then you begin to understand all kinds of other diseases and why symptoms are developing in the body. Because emotional stress, psychological stress, is the most impactful thing on our health. It is more impactful than pesticides. I mean, unless you drink a whole cup of pesticides straight or something. But I mean, I'm not saying pesticides are not damaging. They're destroying ecosystems and all of that. And I eat organic, so that's my values, of course. But what I'm saying is you could be someone eating organic food and have 
psycho-emotional stress related to money, sex, love, personal power, purpose in life, losses, you know, there's many real life stresses that humans face. And these stresses we're facing that we've never been taught about how to navigate through. Most people right, have never been taught how to evolve our soul through stress when it hits us. What is happening for the most part is people get entangled in stress, entangled in stressful family dynamics, relationship dynamics, world dynamics, and the stress grows actually. So instead of us learning and growing through the stress, because we don't even have the tools, the stress itself grows. And then eventually we feel stuck and that causes cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because really you could say, oh, this is only applicable to someone who has cancer. But the reality is it's applicable to everyone if we want to prevent ever growing cancer in our body. And I want to talk about that. But I actually want to back up for just a minute because as you said at the beginning, you spent 10 years living with people with cancer and working with them to heal it. And I would be curious to know how you got into this to begin with. Okay. I was a holistic lifestyle coach many years ago already. So I've been focused on health and holistic health, how everything ties together, not just physical things, but spiritual things, emotional things, and exercise matters, nutrition matters, hydration matters, how we sleep matters. I was doing that years ago, and despite how much knowledge I thought I had then, I was not able to help my family member who developed lung cancer and died, and also someone else that was close to me developed lung cancer and died. And we tried everything to try to heal. You know, every alternative thing we could possibly find to try to strengthen their immune system to beat the cancer, right? That's the theory, like, we've got to strengthen our immune system. But our immune system, once you start to understand cancer, and I teach this in my training today, our immune system cannot even touch cancer. It, it can't do anything about it because it's not a physical problem, it's emotional. So we can make our immune system super strong. It's not going to do anything because, and this is why a lot of people that develop cancer, by the way, they have strong immune systems. They exercise, they're eating well, and they go, I don't understand why I developed cancer. It's because it has nothing to do with the immune system. And this might sound shocking to some people, and I would get that. But, you know, it's just because the whole theory and concept of cancer today is so inaccurate. It's so far from actual accurate understanding that it just leads humanity in all kinds of directions, searching for cures and doing all these things. So when these two people close to me died of cancer, I realized that I must not understand. I must not. I thought I did as a holistic coach. I had them eating organic food. I had them juicing, had them doing all these things. And they also did traditional approaches because things weren't working, right? So just kept trying everything. And then eventually we just had to do traditional approaches. And both of them died. So we worked with all, multiple doctors, multiple naturopaths, multiple other holistic health like healer type people. And myself, all the knowledge I had, none, none of it worked. So that was a painful loss. But it started to reveal things to me. Because two people died really close together, both of different types of lung cancer, and both did combinations of traditional and alternative things, the experience was just such that it made me have to look deeper. And that is what made me realize that, okay, first of all, maybe the mainstream theory of what causes cancer, what it is, maybe that's wrong, first of all, because if that's wrong, then it's like we're just playing a guessing of how to try to heal, right? We're, try everything, do this, do this, do this, do this because we don't actually know what the cause of cancer is. But if we realize that the cause of cancer is psycho-emotional only, then you can stop wasting your time. Well, not wasting time, but stop emphasizing the physical so much and prioritize the psycho-emotional. Then we can start actually having success. And in my residency in Canada, I had a one-month cancer reversal residency for people who wanted to heal themselves. 
and they had tried everything else already. And I had been through that as I've shared, right? So I got it. I get it. All these other things aren't working. So all of my clients were stage three and four and they tried everything. So then they came to my 30 day residency and we focused only on the root cause of cancer as I was theorizing it to be back then. Um, mm. Oh, so is, you were still at that point theorizing it. You yeah. had this inclination. It's got to be deeper. And then you created this. What did you call it? A 30 day, like, 30 day cancer reversal program. OK, it's but... just one on one. And it wasn't like I wasn't treating people or something like this. We weren't focusing on supplements or alternative things. As I said, I had a healthy lifestyle plan there. I was in the middle of a forest. I was raising my own food. I had chickens and goats and sheep and beautiful trails through the forest. And we're in healthy air and we're drinking water from the ground filtered through Mother Nature. Wow. It was a really healing environment, of course. But when cl clients came to live with me, their cancer would, when it would start to disappear and shrink, by the way, I had a 90% success rate. When it would start to sh disappear and shrink, it was when we had the breakthrough. And the breakthrough is psycho-emotional. Every single wow. time, I literally started experiencing people's tumors just suddenly shrinking. And I mean, once you have the breakthrough, they shrink pretty fast, actually. Literally, the very day of the breakthrough, symptoms are diminishing. The next day, they're diminishing even further. It, that's, that's how it works. This and, is with any type of cancer, too, that you encountered with these patients over the years? Yeah. Every, every wow. single time without exception. And then after those 10 years since I've been online, now I've been building the Root Cause Institute because I realized, okay, I've got to teach everything I learned, everything I discovered, right? So now I have my level one and two training. Uh, and now I'm working online over Zoom with clients. I don't have this residency program anymore. But now I'm, ex I'm reaching far more people and many people are taking my training. So this knowledge is now starting to spread. And the number of people that I've worked with online has grown significantly. When I had that 10 year experience, I worked with one person for a month. And then I would take a month off because that's a big responsibility, actually. And now I work with a person potentially every day. Sometimes I've got a root cause session with someone multiple times a week. And it's just confirmed everything even more with more clarity. So my first sort of client is my stepfather who died, where I tried everything to help him, didn't work. Then I started to reflect and I realized man, he went through a lot of emotional pain, actually, before he developed cancer. And I, I thought about that more. And then I also realized that he never cried. I'd never seen that man cry. We never talked about his emotional pain. It was always just kept hidden, kept in the background, you know, try to move on. Yeah. So I just made that correlation. And that's what led to my theory. And so then I thought about the other person that I mentioned who died. And then I realized they had gone through a life event that was stressful. And so when my clients came to live with me in Canada, I did all the lifestyle stuff with them. But... They weren't even interested in that really anymore because they already did that. Most of them were told you're going to die. There's nothing else that can be done. And that's why they're willing to work with someone like me because who's Paul Linker? This is just some person, not an oncologist, right? Not a naturopath. Like, who is this person? But they would read my book, The Purpose, uh, Root Cause of Cancer. And in that book, I was theorizing that stress must somehow be the cause of cancer, right? Because none of these lifestyle things are really solving the problem. And when people would read that book, they'd go, well, that's definitely me. I know for mm -hmm. sure that there's all kinds of stress in my life, at least, right? So let's look into this. So yeah, then when we started resolving that stress together, and it started with just me talking to people, you know, what's gone on in your life. And just having the conversation would start to bring things up that were clearly not resolved. So then as they come to resolution then their cancer would disappear it just disappeared so, so nice. no, no destroying cancer but it's hard for some people to realize that this is actually real because the theory of cancer is that cancer cell is a cell that's grow it's a rogue cell and it's growing out of control 
but it's right. not. It's not actually. There's there's three ways that cancer can exist. It can be growing, yes. It can also become completely dormant and be benign. I've got lots of clients that share their stories with me. They've had a lump in their breast for two years, hasn't changed at all. Seven years hasn't changed. And I have even had clients on my recent level one training, someone shared in the course that they have a lump uh, that has been there for 30 years. And, a, and a, a recent client that we just started work with, he had a lump from the age six until the age 18. And then when, then when he was 18, though, it became cancerous again. So we can have a lump growing, which you'd call cancerous. But then if it stops growing, then we call it benign. But then the other thing is lumps can just disappear, which is what I started observing when I was holding that 30-day program. Right. Yeah. This is interesting to highlight, too, because you just had this inkling through your own personal experiences that there was something emotional. And then you start this 30-day program and you're seeing people actually heal. And mind you, you're not a clinical psychologist or a therapist or anything like that, but yet just being with you and you having insight into this and like asking questions and having dialogue and conversations was able to bring stuff to the surface for them to then address and heal. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, many of my clients share with me things that they never told anyone else in their whole entire life. Mm -hmm. then, then we start talking, of, okay, what's been going on in your life? Well, I was abused a lot by my father when I was a kid or... It's like a lot of people have been sexually molested, actually. Common. If you follow Peter Levine's uh, work, he's a psychologist that focuses on sexual trauma. And he says, statistically, at least one in three people have been sexually abused in their childhood. Then if you just look out into society and think about emotional stress and how we tend to cope with stress. Well, one of the ways to cope with stress is to smoke cigarettes. One of the ways to cope is to drink alcohol. And unless you're a young teenager, then it's necessarily coping. It probably is, actually, but it's more like, oh, this is how you have fun as a human being, right? This is what it's like to be an adult. Now I can drink. But actually, alcohol is a problem, right? It's a problem. It causes disease. It causes accidents. It causes in injuries and violence and all kinds of stuff. If you look out in society, what's really going on is there's an emotional problem. There is an emotional problem. It's related to love. It's related to what we've learned about love and it's related to belief systems and it's related to how, how do we deal with stresses? How do we deal with challenges when they occur? In our and most people have not, I mean, when I, when I say most, I mean like 99% of humanity, we have not been prepared to navigate life psycho-emotionally, right? Oh. The, the school system teaches us education, information. You can learn about geography and math and history, for example. But is that going to help you at all if you have a relationship challenge with someone you're in love with? How's geography or history or math going to help you solve a problem related to fear, guilt, shame, anger? It's useless. Yeah. And so there's a lot of healing and learning that humanity actually needs in order to actually prevent cancer. And yeah. also solve cancer and all the other diseases, too. It's very, very emotional. Yeah. And it perpetuates, right? Because our parents didn't necessarily learn these tools. And then they raise their kids and do the best they can. But they're not teaching their children the tools we need to do this. And then those people grow up and they have kids. And it's the same thing. And it perpetuates on and on generational. And then we wonder why statistically disease and cancers and all this stuff is rising. Even nervous system regulation disorders. I mean, everything rises. Well, why? Because we're not taught the tools. I can think of when I had a huge loss and I was a kid, my parents, they did the best they could. But there was no one there to talk to me about that loss or what I was feeling in my heart or actually physically in my body. There was no one there to help me actually process that. So typically what you do then is you stuff it down because it's too intense to bear. And then you carry that through your whole life until either you do the work or it manifests in some way. Right. Manifests as a disease. Yeah. 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 And the physical. What are some of the most common stressors or repressed emotions that you're seeing tied to cancers? Guilt is a really common one. We can feel guilty and carry guilt inside of us for lots of reasons. And resentment, 
is a really mm-hmm. huge one. People crossing our boundaries, just un- unloving experiences happening. And grief is a really common one because these are all the emotions that result from stressful experiences that have not been resolved. It's not like guilt will cause cancer or resentment will cause cancer. It's unresolved guilt, unresolved resentment, right? That, that we carry. And yeah. that actually will eventually cause cancer if it's intense enough. And the intensity of these types of things has been growing. And that's why cancer has been growing. So there's a few examples. Yeah. Fear. Right. Fear is another one. Fear is mm. huge, actually. That's like massive. We're not taught about fear either. In fact, oftentimes our caregivers live in fear. They live a life of fear, of personal sacrifice. They're not following their passions necessarily. They're sacrificing those because of fear. So we can grow up in a fear, fear-based fear environment and then we become a fearful person. And this leads to all kinds of stress. I find it interesting. Over the years, I've worked with lots of different people, right? So sometimes I work with religious people, of course, right? Like lots of religious people develop cancer and they're confused. Like, why do I have cancer? I pray to God all the time. I'm a good Christian or I'm a good Jehovah Witness or I'm a good whatever, but I have cancer. Why? And this is all really complex stuff that needs to be understood. So I've had to really start learning. What I'm interested in is the truth. And what I mean about the truth is what actually serves life and what actually is loving. There is some serious truths taught, for example, in the Bible, powerful teachings. But I've also realized that there's a lot of corruption happening right inside many religions. And it just depends who the priest is that's preaching. And I'm positive, too, the Bible's been altered a lot. It's been rewritten many, many times, but there's still tremendous wisdom in parts of the Bible. For example, there are many sections of the Bible that talk about fear and how fear needs to be overcome. And if we make choices based on fear, essentially, it leads to torment and suffering. So I have a lot of religious people come and work with me and they are very defensive. Like, wait, you're not... Christian like me, or you're not a Catholic like me, so I don't think I should learn from you. But I help them understand that they're not actually following the teachings of their religion. So if you look into the Bible, it says, do not make decisions based on fear. But then when we start looking into all the stress in their life, there's a whole bunch of fear lived by. So there's a lot of wise, divine sacred teachings that are missing from society that used to exist. Like the Bible was built on those things. But today, because the Bible has been rewritten a lot, and because there's a lot of hypocrites, there's a lot of hypocrisy today. For example, I forget what it's called. There's a documentary out there that talks about how Catholic priests were found to be molesting children, like a whole ton of Catholic priests, right? So that's hypocrisy. Right. So the Bible doesn't teach molestation. Right. But I've, I've had a lot of clients that have had abusive experiences with their parents, for example, their parents, while were very devoted religious people. But yet behind the scenes, they're drinking alcohol, abusing their kids, cheating on their partner, stuff like that. So this is one of the reasons why people just turn with a blind eye. It's because if we're really going to actually stop all the disease and suffering on the planet, we need some people to actually start becoming devoted to love and the truth and at the evolution of our soul, the actual evolution of our soul, so that we start making life a better place psychologically and emotionally. But Yeah, um, and that love is like also the love we have for ourselves, right? Because we're often taught, sadly, a very skewed idea of what love is. You've already mentioned it. I can be taught that love is self-sacrifice. So then I'm, I'm always ignoring my needs or my boundaries or what matters to me in lieu of somebody else because in the honor of love. And we know that intense sacrifice in the name of love can lead to cancer. Yeah. I feel like I heard you talk about that specifically on the last webinar I listened to. Absolutely. Many cases of cancer involve self-sacrifice. And mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, we're taught We're we're taught from a young age, we observe our parents sacrificing themselves in all sorts of different ways, and they also sacrifice us and call it love. 
it's really interesting. This is wild, but I've, I've been realizing this in a deeper way re- uh, lately that in society, it's somehow illegal to abuse adults, right? But not our kids. It's really wild. But a lot of parents will hit kids. But we're not supposed to do that to adults, right? If you just walk up to someone on the street and you hit them, you're going to get actually charged with assault and probably go to jail potentially, right? So that's not appropriate in society. People still do it, of course, especially if there's alcohol involved and all that, right? But behind the scenes, many parents are abusing their children. So we have this mentality across humanity that one of the strategies to raise a child is to abuse them when they do something wrong. So abuse is how you teach them, whether it's physical or emotional. And it's why it's really important to understand because if that's how we were treated as a child when we were growing up, then when we become an adult and we're in a relationship challenge, we will become either physically or emotionally abusive towards them. Because we are taught in childhood that's how you deal with a conflict, or that's how you deal if you're upset with someone, you abuse them. So many of us have been abused by our parents in different ways. It can be physical or emotional. Right? You can't come out of your room for a week. You're not allowed to have this, you know, have things taken away and all this stuff. But what, what we really need most is to be connected with and communicated with. And also, our, a lot of adults today are so stressed out that it's difficult to be a parent because we're st- not able to look after ourselves yet or our own needs are not being fulfilled so then you have a child that actually needs love a lot of patience a lot of support a lot of connection that's the responsibility we have as a parent oftentimes it's difficult to fulfill that role and the whole the whole nature of society just has so many things that need to change because it's so much out of alignment with what supports life and love and instead it's leading to more and more stress for people and that's why cancer is one in two people and the other one in two people in the world are experiencing some other disease. It's not yeah. just like, oh, okay, the other half of the world is healthy then. One, 50% are developing cancer, 50% are healthy. No, no, no. 50% are developing cancer and the other 50% are developing strokes, heart disease, diabetes, chronic pain, skin problems. Depression, suicide, it's pretty intense. You know? Digestive issues, the list goes on yeah, and on. Yeah. yeah. So, so cancer is the peak of it, in my opinion, because it really encompasses it all. If you're going to prevent cancer, you've got to become someone that's conscious and aware of the physical factors of life, like healthy lifestyle things. And the truth, too, not just your standard teachings of the medical system. Actually, organic food matters, even though in hospitals they don't feed organic food. And in hospitals, they think it's okay to feed pesticides and feed sugar and feed all these things, caffeine. So you really got to become conscious and take control of the physical factors of life. And by the way, that leads to better emotional feelings and a better life in important ways. But then we also need to start learning about our emotions and what do we do with guilt? What is guilt? Why does it occur exactly? And how, how do we resolve that? What do we do with resentment? What do we do with our fears? What do we do with meaning in life? And w- what is love? What, what is actually love? And then there's a, some big concepts too. What is God? Where did we come from? All these things. Because honestly, if we're out of alignment, those things, the truth of those things, then we'll develop a disease. Yeah. You know, we yeah. definitely will develop a disease if we do not become a student of life like a student of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual realities of what it means to be a human being. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to be taught all of this and raised in a way from our, by our parents so that when we become a grown-up, we contain it all, right? But because of all the generational trauma and all the wars in the world, like just in the last 100 years, there was World War One and Two, all kinds of broken families, all kinds of stress, just chaos in humanity, right? then it's compromised every generation's ability to ideally raise a child. So there's pain, emotional pain and stress and unfulfilled needs and problems with regards to love and life that we grow up with. And it just keeps being passed on families. So 
cancer is this massive, massive messenger saying to, to humanity, we need to change our focus, to change our values, and we need to start prioritizing psycho-emotional health and love, and not just an intellectual concept of love, but actually start behaving in more loving ways, learning about love and taking it seriously, and drop all the power struggles and the belief systems and the violence, and really start questioning ourselves. That's a huge thing that I teach in my training. You have to question our own ego complex. Because our ego complex was created by damaged parents, probably. Right. Most of our parents were damaged in their childhood. And they went through the war or they went through whatever stresses and they didn't resolve those things. So they passed it on to us. So now we have it. So the question is, are we going to be victims? Are we going to blame? Or are we just going to actually take responsibility and really start doing our own personal healing work? And this is the only way that you can heal cancer. The only way long-term like actual healing where cancer doesn't just come back and you're caught in this vicious war on cancer for years and eventually end up dying the, 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 the secret is that you can only heal yourself and it's by loving yourself like you said that's not simple though you can't just no. love love yourself intellectually okay I, i've decided i love myself same with for, same with forgiveness you can't just decide okay forgiveness is how you heal this is the important thing to do so I'm just going to make a list and forgive everyone. That's just, <laughs> it's just intellectual, right? Like we have, to, it all has to come down deeper into our soul. Real healing comes from the soul. It's, it's in the soul. It's our soul that contains our emotions. It's our brain that contains our intellect, right? It's yeah, our soul sure. and, our, and our body that actually contains our emotions. Mm-hmm. So I have a question that I want to ask you because it's one of those questions that whenever you try to tell anybody that there's a psycho-emotional component to any of their disease, the throwback all the time is, well, then why do dogs get cancer? Why do kids get cancer? Why do babies get cancer? How could the babies be stressed or a young seven-year-old child or a dog who they say is always living in the present, but yet they still end up with all the cancers? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I really respect when people think for themselves and they question things. Well, we could have a whole podcast just on that. I'll share a couple of things. So first of all, when a baby is born, it doesn't take long before a baby cries. So there's your proof that emotions exist in a baby, right? And it's also proof that a baby can have emotional stress. Like that's why it's crying. Babies don't cry because they're happy. They cry because something's wrong. Right. The other thing is, and a lot of parents can attest to this. They know from experience. So if you're not a parent, or maybe if you've not experienced this with your kid, you might not know. But most parents know that your kids pick up on your emotions. Pick yeah, up they're everything. energetic. They... Stressed out. If you're in emotional pain, if you're crying, it just causes chaos in the children. I just did a session yesterday with someone who's recently lost somebody. She's in a lot of emotional pain and she's doing the work with me to grow as a soul through that loss to process. But before doing this session, she hasn't processed much yet. She's cried a few times, but she's not like processing in a way where she's growing through it. Instead, she's just in repeated pain. And what usually happens is if we don't process successfully through it, the pain turns into suppression, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that causes cancer. So uh, so she was sharing with me, though, that a few times now, it's been very revealing to her. She's realized it's been really surprising, but she'll be in one room of her house and she'll get on the phone and start talking to someone about what happened, like her mm -hmm. loss. And then she's emotional she's talking about the thing but she's holding her emotions back she's holding it together but she's feeling it you know she's feeling the stress because she's connecting to it and then her baby which is three years old will start crying and crying and crying a few rooms mm -hmm. over and she's realized that every time she's in a state of stress herself her baby starts crying so our children are mirrors. They are showing us what's actually going on inside us that we have not resolved. And pets 
actually pick it up as well. Our pets are super connected to us. Many people know that if you're sad or whatever, dogs and cats will come over and start licking you in the face and they feel things. So to think that now they don't have an intellectual thing going on, right? And maybe that's why some people think that this can't work this way because a, a three-year-old isn't thinking about money and it isn't thinking about this sexual experience it just had, which didn't feel good unless it's been molested. It's not thinking about the government and how corrupt it is. There isn't really a lot of intellectual stress happening with a baby, but there's massive emotional stress. In fact, babies pick up emotional stress more than adults because most of us as an adult are to some degree suppressed, but children are not. So if a child feels stress energy, it will scream, it will cry, it will throw tantrums. It's not ashamed. It's not embarrassed or anything. It's, it's not afraid of its emotions. It just completely feels everything. Right. And then as a society, we start saying, stop crying, suck it up, be tough. What's wrong with you? It's not that big of a deal. Your emotions yeah. are wrong. Your emotions are wrong. Or it stresses us out, like to hear a baby crying can be really stressful. So then we try to get it to stop. But it's a problem because we've just never been taught how to connect to our emotions and connect to our needs and process them and hold space for them and so on. And it leads to a ton of suppression. So yeah, dogs and children can develop cancer too. And it is because of stress. Yeah. Understanding how incredibly energetic children and dogs are. I just think I always thought they're picking up on what we're putting out into the world and they're with us all the time. So they're just constantly taking all this energy in. And when you think about it, babies, there's thought that we're literally taking in this energy when we're in vitro. Like if we have a very stressed out, high strung, nervous, scared mother and we're in her womb for nine months, we're literally just taking that all in that whole time. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? It can alter it's all kinds of signs that shows mm -hmm. that it alters our blood flow in our brain and different parts of our brain grow more than other parts. Like our hind brain grows more. If our mother stress, our hind brain, which is what processes fear and um, the fight or flight response of the human stress response will grow more compared yeah. to our prefrontal cortex, which is because our, our biology knows that we need to be prepared for this stressful life that we're going to enter into. Because if mom is this stressed out all the time when I'm in the womb, then I've got to be ready for the stress when I'm born. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So I want to just throw in here that this root cause work and beginning to understand the root cause of cancer, yeah, it's so important. But a lot of people then have a hard time because then they feel guilty, they feel blamed, they feel accused of things. It's not about that. It's just about realizing, you know, are we ready to just look at the truth of what's going on and start doing something about it? So you got to start with where we're at. Don't guilt yourself or blame yourself in any kind of a way if you're not a perfect parent or whatever. And especially if a child has cancer, parents could just get so upset at me thinking I'm like blaming them because of their stress in their life that's actually caused stress in the child. Um but it's not about blame. It's about understanding there's a generational problem going on where stress is being passed on from family to family to family. And, and cancer is just a sign. It's a message that we've got to start taking responsibility for making changes, for really tackling this root cause work. Yeah, that's a really good point because a lot of people could feel shame or guilt like you're being blamed or you can blame yourself and it's not a blame game. It's just saying, hey, listen, we aren't saying I'm guilty or I'm to blame for where I'm at today. It's just more saying, hey, let me see where I'm at and how can I make shifts for my future? Yep. An interesting tidbit, something I always notice with my dog, and this is my last dog too. Every time that I had any digestive issues, my dog did too. I'm like, oh, we both have an upset stomach today. And every time that I sleep restless, she sleeps restless. If I'm tossing and turning, she's tossing and turning. Uh -huh. It's so in sync all the time yeah for you for observing that oh yeah uh, it's nuts yeah another example of that is that i've noticed is that if you're happy and having really feeling good like celebratory or whatever then dogs and cats will become playful they're they're really showing expressing a lot of happiness because they pick up on that energy too 
<laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they are really mirrors. They are. Really. Yeah. I think there's this special element to them. They're here for us for a special reason to give us insight into our own opportunities for healing. I believe that for sure. I've been mm -hmm. working on a book actually for a few years now that I want to write whenever I have time. But yeah, it's about dogs and how I view them as angelic beings. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. For these deeper reasons. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I know it's very complex and I know there's a lot of different kinds of cancers out there and probably the psycho emotional cause of each of those. There's probably so many complexities, but could we go over some of the very common cancers and broadly speaking, what is the emotional connection that you're generally observing over the past 15 years? Yeah, well, breast cancer is one of the most common, and that's related to personal sacrifice associated with lo love dynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's complex. That's breast cancer every time, without exception. That's the thing. This isn't a guessing game either. Yeah. As the years went on, I began to realize, whoa, this is actually how it works every time. And that's because of how our nervous system is set up and how our thoughts connect to different parts of our body and so on. How our nervous system processes different types of stresses. Okay, so we got that. What are some other really common ones that you see? Cancers um, and connections. Well, another one is unresolved loss, unresolved grief. And that always causes lung cancer. Mm -hmm. What about prostate? Because that's a very common cancer for men over 60. Okay. Well, prostate has to do with stress related to manhood. So the man's feeling about his own self-worth as a man. So, for example, he could feel like a failure in certain ways. And, you know, what's interesting is the big differences between men and women. It's really quite astonishing once you start understanding the human body more deeply and the emotional components of things because, you know, a woman doesn't even have a prostate. It's kind of interesting. And wi and women have so many organs that men don't have, like a whole entire uterus and a set of ovaries. And when I just connect to my body, those things aren't inside me. I just find it really fascinating. What's interesting too, right, is that women develop breast cancer, but men tend not to. Right. So once you start looking into cultural things then and um, belief systems about men and women and then also the biology of men and women, the physiology, you see big differences. Women tend to be more self-sacrificial than men. They actually do. And that's why they have breast cancer compared to men. Mm -hmm. And so psychologically and emotionally, women can be more self-sacrificial for certain reasons. For example, women are less... Uh, inclined to face fears like women tend to have a harder time with fear typically and we could philosophize about the different reasons why that would be but men tend to be more fearless mm -hmm. so in a conflict in a relationship challenge women tend to be the ones that are a little bit more scared because men are bigger usually and more violent and scarier so women tend to live in a little bit more fear compared to men mm -hmm. and, and how so, does that show up well, then that shows up in more self-sacrifice okay. because the woman's actually afraid to be real because of violence potentially from a man. So the man gets to do what he wants, for example, but she doesn't do what she wants. So instead, she just says yes to things more. Right. So th mm -hmm. that's an example of how this can show up. Well, if you think about the man who in culture holds this feeling like I've got to be the man of the house and I've got to provide financially and keep the roof over our head. And if they fail in any of those things, then that's going to start impacting their prostate beliefs about their manhood and yeah. And their worthiness. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, wow. And that's yep. such a huge dynamic that plays out in our relationships in society. And those are both so Absolutely. common. Yeah. Wow. And so what it really comes down to then again is love. Right. So if you feel like a failure, then that's not love, loving yourself. If you're sacrificing yourself, that's not love. That's coming from, let's say, fear in this one example we gave. Right. There's lots of reasons how this all gets really complex once you look into it. Crazy. I mean, we can understand it, of course, and we can address it and we can resolve it, but it's not that simple. It's not easy to heal up cancer. It really requires a lot of digging in, taking off many layers and really going through 
a true, as I said, an evolution of our soul. We actually have to evolve. We can't just mm -hmm. stay the same we were. It's not right. just release an emotion and then you're healed. No, That's no, no, no. Because yeah. I know because if you got that emotion repressed to begin with, you actually have to understand why this happened or why I feel this way or why I do these things so that you can actually change your behavior so that you don't end up just having a new experience in a year or two years that leads you into the same old experience. You're not repeating these patterns. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And something I want to just say is that cancer, if the human race actually starts to take cancer seriously, we take responsibility for cancer with regard to the root cause. That's what I mean by taking it seriously. I don't think we're taking cancer seriously with the war on cancer. You could argue, well, yeah, of course we're taking it seriously. We raise billions of dollars every year to study new drugs that destroy cancer cells in the laboratory. Sure. But if you really want to take cancer seriously, we have to look at the root cause, right? And, yeah. and then by doing that, as humanity starts to actually address cancer, or as individuals and families and so on, actually, we're going to make the world a better place in an emotional way. Right. Yeah, because the so, more of us that do the healing work, the more that there's a rippling effect. Right. Our world will yeah. have to become a more loving place, a less stressful place, therefore a more loving place, more happiness, more freedom. We will actually start to rise into the potential of human, like being a human. That's our potential as being a human, right? The animal kingdom, cats, dogs, animals, they only have so much potential. They're beautiful creatures, of course, but it's pretty difficult to stop a cat from enjoying killing a mouse and ripping it to pieces, actually. <laughs> so you can look at your cat's just this cutest little fur ball purring every day. But behind the scenes, it will decapitate a mouse and enjoy that. That's the truth, you know. And dogs love to kill squirrels. and In the whole animal kingdom, the, the males are oftentimes raping the females. If you ever watch a rooster have sex with a hen, it does, it's not the prettiest thing. <laughs> so what, what I'm saying is in the human race, we actually have an animalistic nature still. We can, we can lie, we can cheat, we can abuse, we can do all kinds of dark, dark things. But we have the potential in us to rise into really high levels of consciousness and love. It's possible to bring peace to the planet. You know, of course it's possible. Is there peace on the planet? No. Is there peace in a lot of relationships? Some, not all, right? but it's possible. So if we're going to take cancer seriously, we have to look at the root cause. And if we do that, I think cancer holds the potential for humanity to change for real in beautiful ways. Yeah. And if we don't, then cancer doesn't step aside and go, okay, you're forgiven. Cancer is like, if you don't change, like if we don't change, then the rate of cancer is going to rise. It's, it's just going to keep getting higher that it'll be more than one in two people. You know? Well, it's nice to see that there, on a, at least on an individual level, there's more and more and more people who are realizing that there's this emotional component and mind body connection to all healing. And more oh. people are getting into that. And that, I think that's really beautiful. So, and it's shifting slowly, one at a time. Find people like you doing the work you're doing, you know? Yeah, the Great Awakening is definitely here. I mean, wow, 2020, it was scary and stressful and painful in a lot of ways for people. But man, did it ever cause a change to occur, a change of focus? And yeah, people really started taking things seriously. Yeah, well, and that's the beauty I was going to say is like, if for the 90% success rate that you had in those 10 years, that 90% of people might have gone through something that's horrific but on the other side there's this beautiful gift or light or opportunity for them to realize that there's this totally different way that they can live their life for the rest yeah. of it which is really cool yeah and so speaking of also how we can go to treatment we get better but then it grows back the other thing that happens that we see a lot is people start with one cancer and then all of a sudden they have cancer in three different organs and in the medical society they say that it's spreading what is your thought or theory on this? Do you believe it is actually spreading or do you believe they've just reached a point where multiple stressors are all compounding and showing up physically at once? Yeah, it's multiple stresses compounding and new stress appearing in a person's life. And then it's causing new areas of the body that are compromised, which then cancer mm -hmm. starts to appear in. 
but cancer cannot actually spread. It's impossible for cancer to spread in this typically understood way, this logical way. Um, mm -hmm. can cancer can only grow in a part of your body that's truly compri compromised um, energetically. Our emotions are energy, right? It, cancer can only grow where there's compromise. So the compromise happens first, then cancer appears there. But if you don't have compromised parts of your body in other areas related to stress, then cancer can't show up there. It's just like cancer doesn't show up as a random thing, right? You don't just right. wake up one day and you have cancer because of some random thing. Because you ran into cancer, now here it is. Or because of a genetic mutation. No, it's because a part of your body has become compromised due to emotions and that compromised area starts to trigger the growth of cancer hmm. so in your experience through everyone you've observed and supported have you ever witnessed or seen or connected the dots where they started with one cancer and perhaps ended up developing other cancers and other organs as a result of the stress of the first cancer because of the, sh the medical stress or the, sh the fear stress, the, th uh, the fear of dying, the fear of loss of their life, all these sure. things. Is that yeah. happened? Well, I'll give you an example. I've had clients share with me before that even after they're diagnosed with cancer and now they're in a really scary situation where their health is compromised and yeah, they're f face they're taking treatments and whatever, and they're in pain and they're suffering and they're scared. Then their partner goes and cheats on them while they're in the hospital getting treatments. Or their partner still doesn't clean the house, still complains to them. So stress gets compounded because then they feel worse about their life or their particular relationship challenge because they feel like, I deserve love finally, don't I? And then they're still not getting loved. Uh, or um, like they're unworthy. Like, oh my God, no, I can't take care of my house. I'm in the hospital. I'm not being a good mom. I'm not being a good wife. And now I'm unworthy yeah. or I'm not good enough. Right. That could compound. Right. Yeah. yeah. What's going on internally in them, which doesn't even have anything to do with that, anyone else, their own experience and how they're that processing their psycho-emotional reality then gets worse from the inside. So stress can just escalate because of outside factors or from inside factors. And then you have further compromised areas of the body and then cancer appears to have spread. But it's actually just a problem that's spiraling out of control. Wow. Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. Okay, so we have talked about a lot of things. It's so good. I could ask you millions of questions. But for any people out there where do they start and what can we start doing today for prevention? Because like you mentioned, people can have a, a, an experience like a loss and they can just cry and then cry again. Like your client, you gave the example with the three-year-old, but they're just creating more pain. They're not actually processing the grief. What is the difference so someone who's listening can understand that difference and know how to begin taking steps? Because I don't even know that difference. I thought crying was releasing grief, but obviously there's a difference between actually crying and actually processing yeah well for example let's say one of the reasons we cry associated with grief is because we also have guilt so, mm -hmm. a feeling of guilt related to that grief so we can start to cry about the grief and then connect to our guilt and then it just keeps us locked into pain about the grief because we haven't resolved the guilt so then we carry the guilt forward. Eventually, we connect to the grieving pain again that's being held there with the guilt. And so we feel all the pain. We cry about the loss. But because we still feel guilt, then we just suppress everything again and carry guilt. And you, so you can cry repeatedly. Where there's not actually progress being made. So the other thing is we can do things intellectually, but it's not actually being felt down in our soul, in our heart. Uh, so... This is what my level one training is all about, really. One of the most important parts of that training is my 15-step psycho-emotional processing tool. And so I teach 15 steps that you then use for your whole life. And this is how we actually prevent cancer, right? So we can go forward in life when stress happens. If we have stress in relationships, stress with family, stress about money, whatever it is, 
then we actually just go through this system of 15 steps processing psychologically and emotionally. And that's how you actually come to a place of peace. So for like grief, you would be able to transform the grief and the guilt into a feeling of peace. Once that happens, you won't cry anymore. So it's important to cry. It's important not to yeah. suppress all that. But as we cry and as we feel, then we have to transform it eventually into an actual feeling of peace. And most of society's approaches to doing that don't work. That's just the truth of it. Even in standard therapy, I've had lots of clients that have been working with the therapist for five years. Well, you're not actually making progress if you're working with the therapist for five years, you know? Mm -hmm. So then in one session, it's resolved. Because I've learned in 15 years now, this system that I teach. So that's huge. That's what is really essential to learn. And then in my level one training, I explain in more detail how our energy body works and how that is our emotional body, actually. Our energy body and our emotions are tied together and why that affects our physiology, how that works and wh why it leads to how cancer grows and also why it leads to other symptoms in our body. The course addresses pretty much everything that's caused by emotional stress. Yeah, and in that training, then I explain in detail prostate cancer, breast cancer, Breast cancer is complex. Um, they're all complex. The least complex of the cancers, lung cancer. But I explain them all in detail. So that's where I think it's important to start. If you want to really learn about this, then I highly suggest my training. I hold it once every couple of months. It's a recorded training. It's six days of class, four hours each day. And you can rewatch the course because it's recorded. And then I have a monthly call. So everyone that has taken the training, now it's like 115 people over the last few years of holding the training. So there's over 115 root cause practitioners out there now. And That's so cool. Yeah. Do you have a library, like a network or library on your website where people can look different people up that are in their area? Um, I haven't set that up yet, but we've been talking about it because we also have a level two training. And in level two, it gets more advanced because in level two training, this is for people that are really serious about coaching. And then I'm teaching about child experiences and what we need as a child to develop and how our childhood shapes our ego complex today, which ultimately leads to cancer. Level two is more focused on reversing cancer, healing from within. It's much deeper. It talks about God, teachings about God, teachings about love, and I have a 28-step cancer reversal process to go through one step at a time that I teach to my students there. But with each of these trainings, there's a monthly call. So every single month for a whole year afterwards, we get together and students can call in and ask questions, whether they have cancer or they're working with someone with cancer or they have stress in their life and they want support or guidance on that. And it's a pretty valuable monthly call because there's a lot of really potent questions that people ask. It's real life scenarios and those are recorded as well so we have a growing library of those and then also with level one training there's a whole section of resources and continuously expanding like specific teachings of certain things like how to deal with anger how to deal with grief other factors and components that are parts of the layers of it and that resource section is what comes with level one training and then there's a whole other resource with level two so that's what I suggest. I strongly suggest taking my training. If you really want to understand the root cause of cancer and pretty much all other diseases, and you want to go deep, then I've got a lot to share. This mm -hmm. course has a lot of value in it. And you also, like you said, have the one-on-ones where you just go into a two-hour deep session with someone to help them get to at least understanding what might be like what's going on with them at a root cause. Right. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So if I'm helping someone with cancer, if you want to do the root cause work and heal yourself, how my system works is you do a root cause session with me. In that two hour session, we'll figure out what the root cause is. And then I also start doing healing work and guidance together. We also get into the healing process right away. And then okay. I have a mentorship. That's five more sessions that are scheduled at a pace that is wise based on different scenarios and factors. And then a person gets access to my private resources. It's like a course in itself. And it's 
like over 50 hours of videos explaining how to deal with pain. If you're in pain, explaining how to deal with fear and how to deal with boundaries in your life, setting healthy boundaries in relationships and how to learn to say no instead of saying yes all the time. If that's the fact, there's a whole huge section that's essential. So you start becoming a student of your cancer, you know, yeah. in, my men in my mentorship, you go deep and completely transform yourself through this mentorship. That's the goal of it. There's huge sections on taking action, I call it, to love yourself, like to take action. And I have um, self-nurturing practices to undergo different types of meditation. I've got some potent styles of meditation that I teach, but also other things like how to do art for healing reasons and mm -hmm. how to find out what your soul wants for you, right. how to start reconnecting. So this whole mentorship is how I help clients today. I just created it last year. I just started creating okay. it last year because I had to switch from working one-on-one -on -one with the person for 30 days to working online from a distance. Right. And actually, I'm finding this to be more fruitful for me in my soul. It feels because I can help more people at once. And a lot of my clients are sharing, giving permission to share their sessions and their stories just within my mentorship. So that other clients who also have breast cancer or also have pancreatic cancer can start seeing the experiences that other people are going through. And it's really starting to turn into something really special and powerful for helping a person through their journey of healing themselves. Mm -hmm. I love that. How can people get in touch with you and learn more? My website's therootcauseinstitute.com. Okay. And you're yep. on social media too, Root Cause Institute or? Root Cause Institute. Yep. On social okay. media. And you can follow me on Facebook. Yeah. Those are the three ways to follow me. On my website, there's lots of webinars, free free resources, free webinars, free podcasts, ton of helpful information in there. But if you have yep. cancer right now, the best approach might be just to go directly to one-on-ones with you. Probably. It, mm -hmm. it depends. But yeah, that would be the most important. That would mm -hmm. probably be the best thing is to just start one-on-one -on -one because it's customized. If you have cancer, you really, you it, yeah, it should be customized. Yeah. If you can do both, which some of my clients have, it's even better. Wow. Uh, this was so fun. I'm so grateful for you taking your time to just meet with me and share. Uh, your passion is definitely obvious. Like it shows, it shines through in the way you speak and the way you talk about all of this stuff. And I think it's really beautiful. So thank you so much for, yeah, just being here with me. Thank you.